Crucifixion cross. That symbol and that shed blood is what we're celebrating today. Because without it, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. We're going to sing about the cross this morning, the old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old I love that old cross where the dearest can get for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay.
be seated. Well, amen. Enjoyed that singing this morning. It's good to see you. Hopefully, you grabbed a bullet and there's a few things in there. Just want to make mention of one thing. Next Sunday night, we'll start our Sunday evening services at 5 o'clock. Uh, so make plans to be here. We'll have a, a family gym night afterwards. Uh, so anyway, just be prepared to come and enjoy a good time together and fellowship and uh, hearing the preaching of God's Word next Sunday night as well. Again, we're glad to have our guests with us this morning. Hopefully the service will be a blessing to you. And as our members, uh, we prepare to give. You can give out in the offering boxes in the foyer or go to graysonbbc.com and you can give your tithes and offerings there. Let's pray together uh, and we'll ask God to bless this morning. Father, we come before you. Again, just thankful that you give us the opportunity to gather together this morning to worship you. And we do thank you for that old rugged cross, Lord, that through uh, your shed blood, we can have remissions of sin. We, that you do uh, have a way uh, made that we can seek and have forgiveness from you. God, I pray that there be one this morning that doesn't know that free pardon of sin, that they would come and receive it today. God, we ask you to bless the preaching of your word this morning. Bless the gifts and the givers that will be given uh, Lord, I pray that you would just bless the missionaries around the world that are preaching your gospel this morning. pray that you'd have your way and your will in our hearts and lives today. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue our series entitled, That I May Know Him, we want to take a new and fresh look at the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. We're going to take a very old, very familiar uh, story in the Old Testament in the Bible, and we're going to show you through that story some new facets maybe, uh, some things maybe that you've never seen in that story before concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to look in your Bibles at Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Luke, chapter 24, as a way of introduction, I want to show you something that the Lord said. Uh, if you would like to get to know him better, you need to study your Old Testament. And I know that a lot of people say, well, we're in the New Testament age. Yes, we are. But you need to understand that Jesus Christ and God the Father have been revealed in stages. Okay? The people back in the very first books of the Old Testament didn't know uh, one thousandth of what you know about God or the Lord Jesus Christ. And as God began to reveal more and more through the Old Testament, then he began to reveal more and more through Jesus Christ in the Gospels. And then he put the final cap of knowledge and, and revelation on the Bible throughout after the Gospels. The rest of the New Testament, it gives us more advanced knowledge even than Jesus gave us in the Gospels. 
And so it's a, it's a wonderful road to walk through the entire Bible and see the development of the, rela- the revelation of God, to see it from stage to stage to stage to its culmination. Uh, we get to the final revelation of Jesus Christ, and boy, it paints an, an unbelievable picture. Uh, in the book of Revelation, you have the final revelation of Jesus Christ and God the Father, and what an amazing book that the Bible is. And so if you'll join me in Luke chapter 24... Verse 13, let's see what Jesus has to say about the Old Testament. The Bible says in verse 13, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about threescore furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. It came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Now get the picture here. Jesus has walked up to these two people, uh, and they're walking to a city outside of Jerusalem. Jesus comes along, and he's going to talk to them and share some time with them, and they don't even know it's him. I think maybe uh, some Christians might be in that boat today. Verse 17, and he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, Answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? I'm just going to stop for half a second. These two people are so out of touch, they don't realize it's the Lord, and they're asking the Lord if he knows what he's talking about. Just thought I'd throw that in there. And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. Certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said. I have no comment there. But him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fool. Now Jesus is speaking to them. And he says, O fool, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now notice this verse 27. Jesus is going to reveal himself to them. He's going to open himself up, and he's going to show himself to them. He's going to manifest himself to them so that they may know him better. And notice where he starts. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus said to these two on the road to Emmaus, he said, if you want to know about me, what I want you to do is go back to the first five books of the Bible and look at Moses. Well, what does Moses have to do with Jesus? Well, thank you for asking that. Appreciate it. We're going to take a look this morning at our third Christophany. Now, don't forget, a Christophany is just a fancy word for an appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ in physical form in the Old Testament times. Okay, so Jesus actually came down in a physical appearance. He was just here for a minute, and then he goes on uh, to accomplish whatever it is he's trying to accomplish in these Christophanies. But a Christophany is just a physical appearance of the Lord in the Old Testament times. And so, as we're going to see our third one, it has to do with Moses. So, go back to Exodus in your Bible, the book of Exodus, chapter 3. Exodus, chapter 3. Exodus, chapter 3, in verse 1, says this. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert, came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. 
And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, but put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Brother John, can you make this mic work? Now, let me just illustrate how superficial our knowledge of the Lord and of the Scriptures is. Now, I'm not trying to be offensive to you. Uh, I'm going to use myself as an example. When I was a young preacher, I would read through this text, and, and I just was excited about preaching about Moses and the burning bush. But I wasn't excited because I saw Jesus in the bush. Never even occurred to me that that was Jesus. I was excited because when you preach about Moses and the burning bush, you get to be the voice of God and you get to go, Moses. Moses, Moses. That's all I wanted to do. Didn't really matter what was in the text. Didn't really care about the main points. I wasn't really trying to get to know the Lord that much. I just wanted to say that like that because I thought it was cool. And, you know, I think today that we might have the same problem in our Bible study and in our relationship with the Lord. It's so superficial that so much about the Word of God and who Jesus is and what He can do for you and with you and through you, so much of what Jesus is is lost on us because we just want to say, Moses, Moses. Now, go back with me and let's take a little closer look, shall we, at chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Now, before when he went to Horeb, to this, it, Horeb is a mountain range, it's a hill range there, uh, and it, it has a mountain peak uh, that became known as the mountain of God. But you understand in your Bible, after all of these things happened to Moses, he goes back and writes the word of God. He's not writing it while he's out there taking care of the sheep, you understand. It was years later that God allowed him through the power of the Holy Spirit to pen the first five books of the Bible. And so what happened is Moses is out there taking care of the sheep uh, for his father-in-law, and they are going to find a nice well-watered, a nice green pasture place, and that you find at the bottom back then, at the bottom of the hills of this mountain range. So he's there, and he didn't even know it was the mountain of God when he went there. Now he does because he's way down at the end of his life riding backwards looking at the, the things that happened. So he goes to the mountain of God that he didn't know was the mountain of God at the time. And he's got the sheep there. And all of a sudden the Bible says the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. Now we skip over that part. When you read this text you don't even see that part. And all you talk about is the fire and the bush that didn't get burned up. You saw the bush and the fire, but you didn't see Jesus. Jesus is the fire. He's inside the bush. When Moses has got the sheep over there, he's got all the little sheep over on the side of the hill, and all of a sudden when he looks up and sees the burning bush, and he gets over there closer to inspect it in verse 4, we'll see, when he looks in, he sees Jesus in the fire. It's the Lord. When you see the angel of the Lord, that phrase in the Old Testament, nine out of ten times, it's talking about a physical appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. So this is so much more than just a fire. It's not your, your normal fire that you can kindle out in the, at your campground. It's not the fire that you cook your food with. This is an appearance of Jesus Christ himself come down from heaven to talk to Moses. And we'll prove that in just a moment. It says, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Well, no wonder. This is not your everyday ordinary fire. It's Jesus. Did I tell you all that? Yeah, it's Jesus in there. So, of course, he has the ability to appear as fire and appear in the fire and not burn up the bush. Because, remember, he created the bush. And if he wants it to last through the fire, it'll last through the fire. Now, there's a whole bunch of stuff we could get off track of preaching right now. 
But we're going to try to stay focused so we can get to where we need to be. The Bible says, and Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burnt. Because, you know, out in the desert, if a bush, if a bush is on fire, it's going to burn up pretty fast. So Moses says, I'm going to go t- check this out. I'm going to go see what's going on. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, the Lord saw him coming closer to Jesus. God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. That's the only part I, I used to like. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither. Don't come close now. Whoa, whoa, back up, Moses. He said, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Now, there's a little cultural thing here I want to throw in just so you know. Back in the Eastern cultures in these days, they had the same reverence for places, that holy places and places uh, of authority, and they would take off their shoes when they entered into a place of holiness or authority. We take off our hat. At least we used to. So God tells him, Jesus in the, in the flame of the fire of the bush, he tells Moses, wait a minute, stop right where you're at. I want you to take your shoes off because you're approaching holy ground, you're approaching holiness. No, I can't, can't do all that. We got to get going to where we're going. Verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, in case you're wondering about who this angel of the Lord is, he just told you in verse 6. He did not say, I am a messenger sent from God. He didn't say, I am delivering a message. I'm coming to help you. I'm going to help you and give you strength and power like he did on Samson. It's not the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus Christ himself because he said, I am the God. And no angel would ever take on that title if it wasn't the Lord. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, let me tell you, there's a whole bunch here about him, Jesus, being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What did the Pharisees and all, when they were questioning, they come up with this ridiculous story about a woman that was married seven times to all the relatives because they were trying to have children and keep on the the legacy and the name. And Jesus said what? Jesus Christ said, and I quote, God the Father is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living because he's the God of the Father, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus is telling him here out of the flame of the fire of the bush that he's the living Savior of the world. He is the resurrection. Verse 7. And the Lord said... Now, this is still Jesus Christ in a physical appearance talking to Moses. You see, all of us, I don't know all of us, but I've always had it in my head until I started doing this study that it's just a flame and it's God's voice talking out of there. No, it's the appearance of the Lord himself. Jesus Christ is having a conversation through the fire with Moses, and it goes all the way through to the end of chapter 4. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, And have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Aren't you glad that Jesus knows our sorrows? 400 years, 400 years that the Israelites have been in bondage and they've been in slavery and they've been beaten on their backs and they've been forced to work uh, an incredible amount of work and they've done all these things to build all these uh, edifices and all these buildings and things for the Egyptians and they've been under slavery for 400 years and not one moment escaped the vision in the heart of our Lord and Jesus Christ. He saw every bit of it. He heard every cry. He heard every prayer. He heard every every exclamation. Every time those men went home to their wives and said, you're not going to believe what I suffered today, Jesus heard it. He said, I am come down now to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large and unto a land flowing with milk and honey and Unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. 
Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, he says, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Now that's right where you've got to be when God's going to call you. You've got to understand that you cannot do whatever God is asking you to do. So the Lord tells him, verse 12, and he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. I want you to understand that no matter what the Lord Jesus Christ asked you to do, he will be with you. He'll enable you. And we're going to see next Sunday, Lord willing, that not only did the Lord stay with Moses, but he was protecting him, he was guiding him, he was leading him, he was doing all kinds of things through a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, leading them through the wilderness to the promised land. It's such a comforting thing to know to me that no matter what the Lord Jesus Christ asked me to do, he's going to be with me. No matter where we go, no matter what he asked me to do, no matter what he asked me to say, or what he asked me to preach, or whatever comes from our culture and from this life and from our nation and from the world's circumstances, no matter what comes upon us, when Jesus asked me to do something, he's going to be right there in the middle of the fight with me. Just like he was with the three Hebrew children when he walked with them in the fire. So he says, I'll be with you, Moses, and of course, the way Moses is, that's not enough. But I'm glad it wasn't enough, because we would never see this truth about the Lord Jesus Christ if he had just said, okay, I'm going. The Bible says, verse 12, and he said, certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee, when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt. Ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, behold... When I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name, and what shall I say unto them? Now, Moses has already tried to deliver the children of Israel once on his own. He knows how they are. I mean, the guy that he saved his life spread it all around everywhere that he had killed an Egyptian and almost got him killed. So Moses already knows that if he goes back and says, God sent me, and now we're going to deliver the children of Israel, we're going to deliver all of you out of bondage, he knows the first question out of their mouth is, well, who is it? What God are you talking about? You know, I think it's important that we distinguish what God we're talking about. You know, the Egyptians had thousands and thousands of gods. They've been living there, the children of Israel, for 400 years. So they want to know, they're going to want to know immediately, Moses, what God are you talking about? So God's going to help him out. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to tell him what his name is. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. That just memorial there means that's his name. That's his legacy. So what has Jesus just told Moses out of the fire in the flame of the bush? He has just told Moses, and when you go tell the children of Israel in Egypt who has sent you, tell him the great I am has sent you. Now, that may not mean a lot to you. And you say, well, I thought that was God's name. It is. But you just said it was Jesus' name. I know. Because God the Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are all three in one. They're all God. And we don't serve and worship three different gods. We serve and worship one God with three distinct personalities and persons. But as much as God the Father is the great I am, so is Jesus Christ. You say, well, I'm not following you there, preacher. Well, go to the Gospel of John. Go to the Gospel of John in chapter 8. The Gospel of John, chapter 8, 
Let's just begin reading there in verse 48 so you can pick up the idea and in in what's going on. It says, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil. Now can you imagine? Here are these people that were created by the Lord Jesus Christ in creation. He gives them every breath, every thought, every neuron that fires in their brain. He's making it fire. And they are accusing him, Jesus Christ, of being a devil. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. Now, that's an understatement. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. And whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, if, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, that is God the Father, but I know him, Jesus says, and if I should say I know him not, I should be a liar like you, like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Now watch this. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Oh, man, I'm telling you right now, they're riled up now. I mean, they are fuming. There's smoke coming out of their ears, stuff coming out of their nose. I mean, they're mad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus saith, said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, Not only was I there before Abraham was born, Not only was I there before the foundation of the world, He says, But I am. Jesus himself said, I am that I am. I am the great I am. He is selling, telling us so, so clearly and so pe peculiarly that we cannot miss it. We shouldn't miss it. Jesus is the great I am. And so why is that so important? Well, this word, this, ta this title, this name means so much. We're not going to have time to even delve into a, a small fraction of it today. But when you start looking at this name, I am, or I am that I am, Number one, it signifies self-existence. Jesus was not created. He just is. It's not a grammatical error. He is not saying something that's not grammatically correct. He's not the I was, and he's not the I will be. He's the I am, and he always has been, and he always will be. He's always present tense, which means that he was not created. He's eternal. It also means that he is what theologians like to call immutable. That means he doesn't change. The, as we said, in the Gospels, we get a certain revelation of God. Lord Jesus Christ, and then in the rest of the New Testament, we get an even broader, even more detailed definition of Jesus, who he is, because they said in the, in the New Testament, after the Gospels, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. The same Jesus that died on the cross some 2,000, nearly 2,000 years ago is the same Jesus that will save you of your sins today. He hasn't changed. He doesn't love you less. He doesn't care for you less. He is the same Jesus as he's always been. Not only that, he doesn't improve. Jesus doesn't get better every year. You know, he didn't learn. Jesus Christ didn't learn some things last year about how to deal with us, and now he's better at it. He's the great I am. He's always been perfect at it. He doesn't learn new things and go, oh, wow. Well, I wish I'd have known that 2,000 years ago or four or five, 6,000 years ago when I was dealing with Moses. If I'd have known that back in the bush, it would have helped me. No. He's the great I am. He doesn't change. He doesn't improve. He doesn't go backwards. And this is my favorite part. This name, this title means that he is the all-sufficient Savior. 
Jesus said about himself in the Gospels that he not only is the I am, but he, he said, I am the bread of life. If you're hungry this morning, now I'm not talking about because your stomach's growling. I'm talking about if you need manna from heaven, if you need some spiritual nourishment, Jesus is the bread of life. He's the light of the world. He said, I am the light of the world. He said, I am the door. He said, I am the good shepherd. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, I am the vine. Jesus is all that we need in one person. The, wrong, the songwriter said it this way. He said, Jesus, you are our help in trouble. Jesus, you are our hope for the future. Jesus, you are our home for shelter. Jesus, you are all in all. Jesus, you are protection from evil. Jesus, you are comfort in danger. Jesus, you are our strength for the battle. Jesus, you are all in all. Before the heavens, you were there. Before the earth was made, forever now you reign above. Through you, sin's debt was paid. Jesus, you are the rock where we stand. Jesus, you are our vision and plan. Jesus, you are the truth for each man. Jesus, you are all in all. He's everything you need. Absolutely everything you need. You need some comfort this morning? Jesus can comfort your heart. You need a friend or some companionship in this loneliness of COVID? He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You need some help with your health or some health or some medical problems? He's the great physician. You need some strength? He is our rock. He's all-powerful. You need some courage to get into the battle and fight the fights of life? He is our strength and our courage. You need some peace in your life and all the turmoil and all the things that are going on. Jesus is the prince of peace. And most importantly, you need somebody to love you. Jesus is love. But I want you to see something. Go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 1, again, I want to give you the context and the story of what's going on here. John 14, 1 says this, let not your heart be troubled. So he's talking to the disciples in a very intimate surrounding, and they're very upset about what he's telling them that he's going to have to leave. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, say it, church, I am. He is the great I am, and not only that, he is the way. The truth and the life, and no man can come unto the Father except by him. He's not only our all in all and everything that we need, but he is our Savior, and he is the only way to get to heaven. Jesus is the great I am. And you know what it is time, church? It is time for us as Christians to quit looking for everything we need some other place. Why are you looking for all those things out in the world and in the culture? Why are you looking in the, for, for those things in popularity and money and possessions and all those things? They will not bring it. The only one that can do all those things for you is Jesus. The only one that can do those things for you is Jesus. If you're here this morning and you do not know him as your personal Savior and know that he's forgiven you of your sins and you've asked him to come into your heart and save you of those sins and give you eternal life, you can do that today and you can come and meet my Savior. And he can be your Savior. He can be your friend. He can be your eternal life. Because there's no other way to get there to heaven but by him. You can't get there on your own, that's for sure. 
church, it amazes me that we're looking for all of our sustenance and all of what we're looking for and everything we desire in this life in other places. And all of it is found in Jesus. Spurgeon said this, and this is a really long quote, and I'm going to only quote, read to you part of it. But he said this about the two disciples that were on the road to Emmaus. He said, the favored pair were led to consider the best of subjects. For Jesus spake and expounded the things concerning himself. The diamond cut the diamond, and what could be more admirable? The master of the house unlocked his own doors and conducted the guest to his table and placed his own dainties upon it. He who hid the treasure in the field himself guided the searchers to it. Our Lord would naturally discourse upon the sweetest of topics, and he could find none sweeter than his own person and work. With an eye to these, we should always search his word. Oh, for the grace to study the Bible with Jesus as both our teacher and our lesson. Oh, let me tell you, Dr. Charles Stanley said this morning when I was watching him preach on TV, he said the absolute most important thing in your life is your personal, not your church, not your family, your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And the way you grow that is spend time with him in his word and in prayer. He's the great I am. He is all you need. You will never plunge the depths of Jesus Christ and come up empty or dissatisfied. Jesus is all we need. And if you're here this morning and don't know him as your personal Savior, don't know if you're on your way to heaven, would you come and let us introduce him to you today and you can be gloriously saved? Would you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed today? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Lord, we come to you this morning and we have done the best that we can, which is not much. Lord, there was a lot I wanted to say, but I prayed this morning that you'd only allow me to say what you wanted me to say. And so, God, I've done everything that I can do. And now, as at the beginning, in the middle, in the end, it's up to you to speak to your people. God, I pray that you'd speak to hearts. Help them to realize that we're looking in all these wrong places for something that will satisfy us when you're standing there all along. Two on the road to Emmaus didn't even know you were there. And, Lord, I think that's a lot of times the plight of a Christian in our churches today is that they're looking for satisfaction and joy and, and peace and comfort in all these other places. And there you are standing there with an unlimited supply of all those things, and they haven't even considered you. God, would you help us? Lord, we need your help so bad. We're so desperately wicked. We're so sinful. God, I pray that you'd help us today to look to you for everything that we need. And Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, would you help them to come to know you today? Help them have the courage to step out in this invitation time and come and grab the hand of one of our counselors and say, can you show me how to know Jesus? I want to be saved. I want to know that I'm on my way to heaven. Would you help them to do that today? Lord, we'll thank you and praise you for whatever you accomplish in this service because it will only be you that has done it. We'll give you the glory and the praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we sing a verse of invitation. Maybe you need to come and just say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've been looking for all these things that I need in all these other places, and there you were all the time. You want to just come and say, Lord, help me to see you, that you are the great I am. You're all I need. There's nothing else in this world that I need besides you. Would you help us just to do that today? You can pray, make those prayers. You can make those commitments today as we have our invitation song. And if you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, don't know you're on your way to heaven, would you come and let us help you with that today? as we sing.